Hi, my name is John Carfield. This is the Releasing Kings newsletter. It's May 10th, 2015. I want to talk to you today about uh, Welcome to Warfare. This uh, newsletter is a little bit longer than uh, the video, so I'm going to be skipping parts of it, and I encourage you to look at the, uh, the blog. I also have a graphic there that I want you to see. But basically, what's been on my heart is just the uh, awareness that in our culture and in our Christian community, there's an ingredient of uh, pacifism. And uh, I'm, what, I, what I've noticed is that as I've released my own heart into becoming who I am and have helped others to do the same, what we're finding is that, uh, for example, in politics, that uh, I, I've come to an awareness that God loves the, the United States as well as 160 other nations and that it's partly my responsibility to help my nation, as well as other nations, to become uh, what God has for us. There's a destiny on, on cities and nations, just like there is on individuals, and God has placed it on our hearts to uh, carry those nations, those cities, those communities, those states into the place that God has for them. So there's a, a responsibility on one hand and a burden that's really from the Holy Spirit on the other to get involved. Now that's different from where I used to be and where probably you used to be as well, in that I used to think of uh, politics and business as dirty and beneath uh, Christians to get involved. <laughs> so that's changed and I'm sorting my way through uh, those feelings and I'm trying to articulate that in this newsletter. So with that introduction, um, the new is that we're giving ourselves permission to undertake great kingdom initiatives that bless nations and at the same time is encountering the deceitful powers of darkness reacting to Jesus in us. Like Nehemiah, we're building the walls with weapons at the ready. So Jesus was the essence of love and compassion and mercy who forgave Mary, healed the beggar, and raised Lazarus from the dead. We always think in terms of, you know, what would Jesus do in this situation? He was also the lion who confronted the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, called them blind guides, and referred to their father as the devil. <laughs> now, that's strong language. <laughs> and if anybody did that today, they would say, that's not what Jesus is like. But in reality, that's exactly who Jesus is like himself. So Jesus loved and, and welcomed God's people, yet he resisted evil. Those who embraced the light felt his love, while those who embraced evil felt his truth. I feel trained and comfortable with love, acceptance, and healing, yet I feel very untrained in resisting and confronting evil expressed through ideologies, spiritual powers, and people. How to confront those things is not something I'm comfortable with yet. So, um, and I'm seeing, for example, the news media is um, sort of a, a bastion of oppression in a way. Uh, it's like watching professional wrestling where intellectuals shout over one another, belittling the opposition in tirades of talking points that uh, are unnerving. Um, so, they're, they're prone to cover everything the devil is doing while ignoring everything God is doing. And it leaves my heart defiled and doubtful that the kingdom can come. And I've noticed that it takes me out of my heart and into a level of mental cynicism. So let's talk about cynicism for just a moment. This is something I've learned this week, and I've seen it in myself. Maybe you'll see it in yourself as well. Cynicism has become embedded in our culture and is even held up as wisdom. But there's nothing wise or even likable about cynicism. It's a cleverly disguised expression of passivity and hopelessness. How many times do I tell myself that it's, not, it's just not worth the effort, that I'm, not an that I'm an idiot to even try and make a change? Or that the person with a dream for improving things whom I just met will probably fail? Um, it's like it happens daily. And then I have to have this stern word with myself because I've come to understand that cynicism is the ultimate enemy of getting anything done. It's the ultimate enemy of a better future where dreams come true. 
Cynical resignation is morphine for the wounds of unrealized hope. If we convince ourselves that little can change, we don't have to risk taking action on our dreams. We resign from the fight, which is exactly the intent behind the spirit of the media. The equivalent expression of the heart is cowardice. And I've got a graphic uh, that just uh, shows the progression from pacifism to initiative through uh, cowardice, being optimistic, being inspired, inspired, and then being active on the hard side. And, the, and on the mental side, it's going from cynical to being discerning and wise, and then taking initiative. So I want to describe two areas. One is, uh, what do these people sound like that could do this? Let's talk about their words. I want to suggest that God is raising up some kingdom people who are not passive and are willing to join the fight to defeat enemy tactics. They have several characteristics, but the first is that they will not tolerate a lie or a liar. They speak truth with love. It feels like a velvet-covered brick in terms of its clarity, its authority, and its anointing. Lies cannot stand in the presence of these vessels. Their yes means yes, and their no means no. These folks have a backbone, yet they're not mean-spirited or demeaning toward other people. Um, they are, they are a rock in terms of shining a light on darkness. Their words have impact because they connect truths that other hearts are feeling but have been afraid to articulate. The first lie being promulgated right now in our culture is that there is no evil, no devil, no demons, no hell, and no judgment now or in the future. No justice. The godly values are no better or worse than cultural or cultic values. They're all in a big melting pot and they don't have any, one doesn't have any more worth than the other. That's multiculturalism. Uh, now there are some benefits to that, but you know, um, when it comes to um, entertaining or retaining godly values, that's the end of it. So do we see this in scripture, how to, how the, how to handle this kind of language? In Acts 6 verse 9, these men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. Isn't that amazing? And in John 7, 43, these people were divided because of Jesus, not united. These people were divided because of Jesus. <laughs> Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees and asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. And in Luke 21, verse 15, Jesus told his disciples, For I give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Now imagine speaking under the wisdom and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and in a, in a sort of a debate setting and having that level of influence. That's what God has available for us. So 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, starting, The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So, that's what the words sound like. It's, isn't that amazing? And the, the second is the actions. Um, so I'm going to allow you to read that. Just um, These people are willing to not only talk, but they are willing to do. And I want to put it in context in closing. The warfare is the lesser part of the whole. The largest truth of the kingdom is that dreams come true, and in the end we fill the earth with God's glory. Our optimism and inspiration are rooted in the tangible activity of the Holy Spirit to bless nations, release hearts, and lift up the name of Jesus. Though the warfare is a real aspect of kingdom that we must navigate, it is really training for a much larger party that has already come. The kingdom is already here. It's just growing right now. It's becoming bigger and more influential. So we can hear the music now and the celebration of victory has already begun. Jesus' kingdom has come. The greatest and most incredible conspiracy theory is what the Father has in mind for his people and the nations in terms of blessing them, not judging them, uh, but uh, redeeming them. 
Acts 14, verse 21. After they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So if you say yes to warfare, if you say yes to entering in for the, uh, for the war involved in, in redeeming your nation, guess what? It's a contact sport and there will be some tribulation and there will be some backlash. <laughs> Welcome to the party. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4 verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far else outweighs them all. So my, the bottom line is I'm not encouraging you to be a martyr. I'm encouraging you to be a victorious warrior, not afraid of the battle, not afraid to get involved, not a pacifist, but one who takes kingdom initiatives and is willing to speak the truth in love. Go for it, brother and sister. Amen. <laughs> Have a great week.